Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Cutter webinar. I'm Rich Whalen. I'm the host of today's session on piling sustainability with drones. And before we turn it over to our expert, uh, Helen, today, I just want to let you know about a couple of different things. First off, how you can, uh, well, a little bit about Cutter first. That's what we want to talk about first. Uh, Cutter Consortium is an Arthur D. Little uh, community. Uh, what I want to highlight on from this slide is that Cutter has no ties to vendors. What that means is um, our consultants, our experts, they speak from their experience, not based on the influence from any vendors, outside sources. It's strictly on their knowledge and their experiences. So they truly are experts in their individual fields. Uh, a little bit about how you can ask questions today. Uh, we will be doing Q&A at the end of the session. Um, obviously, you could how to change the audio settings. Uh, you are muted upon entry and will be muted uh, throughout the entire session. Uh, you can ask questions via chat if you have a question about the logistics. Uh, or, or something like that, I can reply to you that way. Um, and then we have the Q&A uh, uh, section where you can type in questions uh, for Helen to answer at the end of the session. Should you type a question into the chat portion, don't worry about it. Uh, you don't need to retype it into the Q&A. I do monitor both at the end of the session. Uh, and most importantly, if you do end up leaving the meeting accidentally due to disconnect or whatever, you can rejoin the webinar as long as we're still in progress. And now a little bit about Helen. She's a cutter expert, a member of Arthur D. Little's AMP Open Consulting Network. She is also president and co-founder of Drone Arrival, a company that helps organizations leverage the transformative power of drone-based technologies as the foundation for a new breed of solutions for private and public sectors alike with the goal of improving businesses and lives. With her more than 20 years uh, helping businesses innovate through technology, she has extensive leadership, advisory, and research experience particularly as it relates to digital strategy, organizational structure, and culture. And as I turn it over to Helen, I forgot to ask you one important question, and that's how you pronounce your last name. So I didn't it want to is, it. <laughs> it is Pukshta. Okay. It, it takes some practice, Rich, so I do not blame you. Thank you. So I turn it over to you. Wonderful. Well, um, thank you, Rich, so much for that introduction. Um, I want to say good morning, uh, good afternoon. And good evening. I know we have many time zones represented in our audience today. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, the way I've, let me click on it. There we go. Uh, the way I've structured um, today's webinar is uh, first, I'd like to give you a quick primer on drones. Uh, I know most of you, to most of you, this will be nothing new, uh, but I just want to make sure we're starting from the same. Point. Um, my purpose today is to highlight two aspects of drones that are related to sustainability. One is how energy efficient drones are themselves, uh, both in their use phase and throughout their life cycle, and also um, how they actually support their drive for sustainability through specific applications and, and ways of using drones that directly contribute to sustainability. And the examples I'm going to uh, cover uh, may seem over the map, but that is kind of intentional because I'd like to highlight the universal applicability and adaptability of this technology. Um, and the two things they're going to have in common is that drones enable those use cases, those applications, and number two, they all contribute to sustainability. Yeah. Uh, our topic today, of course, drones for sustainability. Um, and then before wrapping up and turning it over to you for questions, I will highlight some um, of the limitations of drones and also touch on how to structure uh, your ROI return on investment thinking when adapting or investing in drone technology. So uh, introducing drones, um, drone terminology, the three terms you, you see here, drone, unmanned, or uncrewed um, aerial vehicle and uncrewed um, aircraft system are pretty much synonymous. So uh, just whenever you see them, it, they generally mean the same thing. Uh, UAS can imply a broader system of which uh, the, the vehicle itself would be a part, but they all apply to uncrewed and remotely controlled aircraft. Uh, and just a little side note that there's been an industry-wide change recently from uh, the terminology of unmanned to uncrewed. So it is more gender neutral. And um, some other terms you may see is SUA, SUS, or RPS. Um, 
there are two main categories of drone design, multi-rotor or multi-copter, that is using the um, propellers, the, the copters as the lift generating mechanism and fixed wing. And the preponderance of commercial drones that you probably have encountered um, or perhaps even used are multi-rotor. Uh, typically they will have four or six, uh, sometimes more spinning propellers. The, the advantage of this design is vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, they need very little space uh, to start their operations. They can hover in space and that's very important. They can cover for longer periods of time with reasonable precision. Um, and they offer a pretty uh, detailed, precise maneuverability. So they have that ability to make a 90 degree turn quickly and gracefully. Uh, for example, when you're doing your photogrammetry mission. And fixed wing drones uh, don't have the same degree of maneuverability, but they tend to offer longer flight times, uh, generally um, more of flight endurance, um, which in some applications may be more important than the, the, the maneuverability aspect. Uh, and of course, there are many innovative designs in between where a drone starts out as a multi-copter for takeoff and landing, it takes advantage of that um, design, but then behaves like a fixed wing in flight. So over the last few years, and keep in mind, this is a fairly new industry in terms of commercial applications of drones, um, six years and counting, um, and, and those, those innovations um, have been coming quickly and we expect many more. In terms of how drones are powered, um, all uh, prosumer, consumer, and most commercially used drones are going to be electric battery powered. Uh, because of that, their maximum flight time is going to be between 20 and 50 minutes, depending on the model. Uh, the longer range drones, if you want to go beyond an hour, for example, would be either gas powered or uh, there's some innovative designs that combine gas and electric where the gas engine is used um, not to power the engine itself, but to generate electricity in flight in order to power the drone. Um, and this takes place in a, a high efficiency gas to electric power conversion. And drones in that category that, that we've seen and worked with can give you impressive five hours of flight time. So that's a, that's a big departure from you know, 30 to, to 45 minutes. Um, unlike crewed aircraft, drones don't carry the weight of humans on board. So don't have to accommodate the human size, shape, or, or comfort. Um, and the range, range in size and designs that, that really are fit for their specific purpose or specific type of mission that they specialize in. So drones are a technology where many um, of the aspects of innovation that we currently care about converge. So they are flying robots that can be completely automated. Uh, they can help with artificial intelligence tasks. They lead to higher safety and productivity. And on top of that, um, they do it all with very low carbon footprint. Uh, and we'll talk about that aspect more in a, in a minute. But our view is that drones are a disruptive class of technology that, that cannot be ignored. And like any disruptive innovation, um, this technology will lead and is already leading to new capabilities, to gains in productivity, but also the, the technology challenges organizations and societies to find ways not only to benefit, but also to adapt to the changes that they introduce. Um, so for example, having skies filled with drones may not be everyone's dream come true. Um, and both from technology and um, technology adoption perspectives, we were still envisioning how to do that and how to adapt to it. So how energy efficient are drones? Um, the battery powered drones tend to be, just really by nature of their design, energy efficient. Um, again, there's no need for a cockpit. There are no special instruments. There are no critical systems required, typically of crewed aircraft. Um, there's a study from 2018 that was conducted by the US Department of Energy and RAND 
that serves as a really excellent baseline for thinking about efficiency of electric drones. This was in the context of package delivery. Uh, and it's a study that looked at the most efficient, energy efficient ways to deliver packages uh, using different sized drones, uh, a variety of trucks, uh, or just cars for, for retail pickup. Um, and this study looked at the entire life cycle of greenhouse gas emissions for one pound package delivery. The, uh, the conclusion was that small, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Um, allergy season, uh, electric drones were the most uh, energy efficient from among the different choices of delivery. And I'm gonna switch to a graph uh, from that study that, that illustrates that pretty well. Um, they made a distinction between a, a drone charged with um, low carbon electric power, for example, in California, as opposed to a drone charged with um, power electricity that is still very much dependent on coal, um, for example, in Missouri. And then the US average is somewhere in between. Uh, but as the electric power gets greener, um, and that is the direction worldwide, uh, you should expect these numbers to shrink even more. So energy efficiency of drones also applies Excuse me, please. Uh, also applies to what happens to all those batteries where they die. Um, and and the, the story here is pretty much the same as for any other electronics, such as cell phones or, or electric cars as well. Um, it turns out that it is still cheaper to make a new lithium battery than to recycle it. Uh, recycling uh, these batteries is very resource intensive and it's difficult to recover the materials in a form that is usable. So that is the reason why <clears throat> only 5% of lithium batteries are being recycled and we are still using the resource intensive mining to produce and consume more lithium, graphite, um, cobalt and, and other, other metals. Uh, so lithium battery recycling is a broader problem that needs a solution um, and putting a robot on it to perform the task uh, seems to be a, a promising uh, potential path forward. Advanced air mobility is something that a lot of people have been looking forward to for a number of years. And this is an area that often generates the most interest. It's sort of futuristic and, and really, really cool. Um, and some of the main categories there are package delivery by drone and drone air taxis. Uh, and generally transportation under uh, urban air mobility um, falls under that category as well. Um, what unites these applications is, is that they will use, when in place, uh, highly automated and energy efficient unmanned or uncrewed, still learning, aircraft systems um, or drones. They will also fly at lower airspace altitudes. So this is airspace that is significantly below the regular traffic of airplanes and helicopters. Uh, just to give you an idea, today, for example, the maximum allowed altitude for a drone is 400 feet above the ground here in the US. And pretty much worldwide, it tends to be you know, at about 120 meters or so. So the advanced air mobility traffic would occupy that space. So how come we're not taking taxis, uh, drone ta air taxis to, to work yet? The drone technology by and large um, is ready. Uh, it can be tweaked more and there are complaints of uh, perhaps insufficient safety record data. Like for, we need Amazon Air to tell us how often their delivery drones crash. But the drone technology um, can be made to meet any specific requirements and it's pretty mature at this point. The bigger gap preventing air mobility from taking off has to do with um, missing or not yet adapted infrastructures and communication frameworks that can handle high volume operations. And those frameworks and standards are being actively worked on. Um, and it will be some time before that works turns into a reality. So a lot going on behind the scenes, we're just not seeing the results yet. 
So to be sure, we all hear about uh, drone delivery pilot programs um, with drone delivering coffee or pizza on campuses. But those are experimental in nature, uh, permitted only on a small scale, and, and really do not fulfill the promise of advanced air mobility. Um, so the logistical and infrastructure challenges that I described, um, slow adapting FAA regulations, are likely going to hold back that promise for a little bit longer. But when it's here, the advanced air mobility is expected to bring huge benefits to the economy, to the environment, and to our quality of life. So there are parts of the world, however, where drone deliveries, uh, specifically in particular of medical uh, materials and supplies have made an impact uh, and made a big difference. Um, so a great case study here is Zipline. It's a California-based company whose mission is to ensure that every human um, has access to critical medical supplies. And to that end, the company uses drones to solve a pretty ubiquitous problem in certain parts of the world, and that is uh, that less mile delivery to hard to reach areas. So Zipline started their operations in Ghana, then uh, moved to India, Nigeria, Philippines, Rwanda, and now on a limited basis, and I have to stress limited basis, it is also operating in the United States with plans for, for more operations in, in years to come. But here are some numbers that we're talking about. Um, as of a couple of months ago, Zipline drones traveled over 20 million miles and made some 275,000 deliveries. Uh, they make some 75% of blood deliveries in Rwanda, outside of uh, the country's capital, Kigali. They also delivered COVID-19 um, vaccines to 40% of Ghana's population. So these are pretty impressive numbers. And today, Zipline is valued at uh, two and three quarters billion dollars. And it was built on a business model of using drones to fulfill an urgent need. And, and that urgent need was to deliver medical supplies to areas that could not get them at all, or would get them with substantial delay and potentially putting lives at risk. So medical supplies delivery is a popular area where drone solutions already available, are already available to work seamlessly with hospital systems and are able to autonomously deliver. So you don't need a pilot there every time monitoring the operation. And we know that there's room for them in any medical or hospital setting or campuses uh, where urgent and careful delivery is essential. Uh, but here in the United States, like with all drone delivers, deliveries, there's still uh, many regulatory hurdles to jump over before this type of service can be available on a commercial scale. And again, make a difference um, in terms of sustainability. Precision agriculture is another example of drones contributing to sustainability. Uh, it is considered a cornerstone of sustainable agriculture because it directly benefits crops, soils, and groundwater, and it helps with food availability. Precision agriculture is about producing higher yields through efficient use of key resources like land and water, and lowered consumption of fossil fuels, fertilizers, pesticides, and other chemicals. So essentially, we're lowering the amount of input particularly of harmful inputs, uh, yet still producing sustainable or higher yields. Uh, drones are currently one of the key enablers of precision agriculture. So they help with uh, a, a number of activities, uh, crop scouting, weed detection, soil assessment, uh, plant counting, harvest planning, irrigation assessment. They can, um, spray crops, and they even help with planting of seeds. So they really, drones are usable within uh, an entire spectrum of um, processes and, and activities within the agricultural um, setup. Um, they surpass the traditional methods of using satellites or, or crude airplanes for image collection and mapping 
and that they provide a higher spatial and temporal resolution, uh, meaning there's more detail, uh, better quality of, uh, of data, of, uh, of information that's being gathered, and that detail can be obtained much more frequently. So this can be monthly, this can be weekly, this can be daily, um, hourly, if you wanted to. If you imagine uh, employing or using an airplane uh, at that frequency, that, that would be um, cost prohibitive and, and probably uh, too much of an overhead to execute. So compared to agriculture airplanes, drones are lower cost, lower overhead. They can be deployed at a moment's notice and they don't produce gas emissions or put a pilot at risk. Um, Drones carry and collect data through many specialized sensors. These are called payload, and they can be built uh, in with the drone itself, or they are removable. So there's the regular light camera, RGB, uh, multispectral, thermal, lighter, hyperspectral cameras. And keep in mind that the same sensors and cameras, maybe with the exception of uh, multi and hyperspectral, are used in pretty much every other industry. So what do we do with the data collected by drones? Um, and again, this will not be unique to agriculture, but you can create orthomosaic, thermal, digital surface, and NTVI maps that are used to check on crop performance and identify areas needing attention. What is important about the data is that it is geotagged. So you have your precise coordinates that can later tell your chemical application or seeding systems exactly where to apply seeds or chemicals and how much. And this is very much in support of what's called the variable rate seeding. Essentially distribute where it's needed and as much as you need it and no more. So drones themselves can be used to apply seeds and chemicals and because they have superior maneuverability, their applications can also be very precise. So you are reducing drift and environmental impact. So drones help farmers get better return on their investment by reducing operating costs, improving crop quality and increasing yield rates. So, and in addition to creating this economic value, they're also contributing to sustainability. Conservation is actually one of my favorite topics when it uh, comes to drones. Uh, conservationists have used drones for many years because they facilitate more effective and less intrusive interactions between the scientists and the animals or the plants or natural habitats that they're studying. Uh, there's an excellent report by the World Wildlife Fund that lists numerous uh, cases of drones used for conservation. Uh, and it's actually very impressive how uh, the conservation community has adopted drones, drone technology pretty early on and is continuing to use them uh, as a new tool and a, a new way of conducting their work. So for example, drones collect images of whale species that can then be automatically classified with high accuracy. They can assess the weight and size of individual marine mam um, mammals uh, with drone photogrammetry and volumetric techniques. And by the way, these are the same volumetric techniques applied to a whale that are also used with drones in construction or in mining applications to measure stockpiles um, and, and, other, um, and other areas of a, a construction area or mining area, so for example. A frequent use of drones is in surveys conducted to detect, measure, and monitor shoreline erosion. Leland has such applications here in Illinois with a shoreline of Lake Michigan. In one of the simplest applications I've encountered, drones are used as a deterrent to prevent conflict between humans and wildlife. <laughs> For example, drones prevent elephants, elephants from venturing to villages. And this works before um, elephants are afraid of and avoid the African honeybees that often attack um, elephant sensitive areas, including the eyes. So 
buzzing drones simply remind elephants of a swarm of bees and are enough to uh, deter them from um, entering the area they should not be entering. And uh, amazingly, it works. Uh, rehabilitating young animals without habituating them to um, human contact is, is, has always been challenging. Um, here, one example is of a, a bear orphanage in Romania, where drones are used to help the cubs learn to forage for food uh, while avoiding human scent and interactions. The drone drops off the food uh, in a vari variety of locations where the, the bears can look for it um, and um, avoid unnecessary contact. Uh, using drones in the wild, of course, is best left to scientists and conserva conservationists um, because recreational use of drones can be very disruptive to wildlife. Uh, the other downside is that poachers have unfortunately learned to use drones to locate their victims. Um, and that is the reason, for example, that the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania has an outright ban on drones, and that's mainly to prevent animals from becoming habituated to them. A much different example of uh, drones contributing to sustainability is their application in light shows. These are night displays in the sky of choreographed uh, light shows that use small drones with LED lights controlled by um, custom animation. They are significant because uh, they're increasingly used in place of fireworks. And fireworks, as much as we all love them, pose uh, fire and pollution risks. And in many areas, particularly where areas that are experiencing severe droughts, they have been outright banned. <clears throat> and this often applies to um, the, the professionally delivered fireworks, which tend to be, by the way, very safe. These people know what they're doing, um, but the risk is just too high for them to proceed. Um, so drone shows are fun to watch, um, but they're also a, non, a no pollution, no fire risk, reusable alternatives to fireworks. Um, they also give you more creative freedom than pyrotechnics. Uh, in storytelling and targeted messaging. So even though it is a niche industry, drones have opened up new revenue opportunities to drone show providers, uh, new creative options to the events industry, and also at the same time are contributing to a better environment uh, and sustainability. These are all examples of what drones can do for sustainability, but they, of course, also come with limitations. And, and here are some of the important ones. Um, the drone operations are limited to adequate weather conditions. So high winds, low visibility, icy conditions are simply not safe for drone operations. Um, there's also the, the risk of electromagnetic interference from towers and other objects um, that can stand in the way of operations. Uh, experienced pilots uh, know what to do with those and, and how to structure the, their missions to, to avoid the possibility of encountering that. Um, as I mentioned, the limited endurance, endurance of um, purely electric models is too limiting for many types of operations, especially over longer routes. However, as I also mentioned, there are some hybrid uh, options available now that did not exist a few years ago. So, uh, drones are regularly flown over, you know, lengthy gas pipelines uh, for inspection purposes. Um, swaths of very large areas are still best handled by crude aircraft. Um, so if it's, you know, say something like uh, 200 acres and, and, and more, um, drones were not the most efficient or effective way to, to survey them. Um, because in the remote setup, the pilot of the drone is on the ground operating it with a remote control device. There's a need for a continuous wireless connection between the pilot and the drone. And that connection could be vulnerable. Um, however, all leading drone makers are now using strong telemetry link encryption that is pretty much near unbreakable. Um, but it's always something to double check when, when investing in a fleet of drones. And lastly, the, the regulatory landscape in the US and many other countries 
It's limiting the potential of autonomous and beyond visual line of sight drone operations. Currently in the US, you may operate a drone only if you can still see it. You can also, uh, there's a waiver framework process in place with the FAA where you can request um, that those rules be changed for your operations. Um, and there are companies that do beyond visual sign operations, um, but that is on an exception basis. Um, and the autonomous part, um, the, the regulations still require that um, there be a pilot on hand available with every drone that is flying. Again, this can be waived, um, but not on a, it is not available on a large scale. So until we get to the point of autonomous and beyond visual line of sight operations, um, and even though there's already value to the economy and to the mind from the drones, um, but we're still very far from the full potential of drones. That's, that makes it a very exciting field. Um, return on investment. So as, as with any promising technological innovation, you should first look at the threats and opportunities that the innovation presents and go from there. Uh, the main categories to look at include, include potential new revenue streams, of course, and there's cost reduction, risk reduction, productivity gains, sustainability gains. Um, and here, if you, if you can do something just as well, perhaps even without uh, productivity gain, but just as well with a drone, but it gives you a, a more sustainable solution. And that is certainly always a, a good argument for moving forward to it. And there's the competitive necessity as with any new technology, um, as it becomes mainstream, and in many industries, drones are already um, becoming mainstream or, or uh, pretty much assumed to be a standard tool in the tool set of, of many operations. Um, it just becomes necessary to adapt to adapt it as well. So the, these are really categories or ways of thinking of ROI that are not unique to drums uh, and the same frameworks that you would apply, apply here. And this is, this is my summary slide really. What I hope I demonstrate is that drums are a low cost solution, particularly when compared to alternatives, uh, whether it's an airplane or a human in hazardous terrain. Uh, it is very accessible. Many applications are fine with uh, just prosumer grade drone uh, that you can pick up at, at local Best Buy. Um, and everyone can study for and take the, the multiple choice exam to become a small UAS pilot. Uh, drones are very easy to deploy and their automated missions can be um, defined quickly um, and adjusted in the field as needed. Um, they are remarkably, remarkably versatile. Um, the same sensors can be applied in a multitude of industries and applications. Um, and lastly, they produce no emissions while in use uh, and leave a relatively small life cycle of carbon footprint. So a strong prediction is that uh, drones will continue to be cost-effective and energy-efficient tools in the drive for sustainability. And that, and with that, I will uh, turn it over to the audience for questions and answers. Great, Helen. Thank you uh, very much for your uh, for a great presentation. I just want to remind everyone how you can ask questions during the session, or uh, right now actually, is uh, by typing in the Q and A portion uh, on the bottom of your screen on the toolbar. It could be on the top of your screen, depending on where you situated it. Um, you can type those in at any time. Uh, and we will read them off as they come in. Uh, the first question asks, can you program a drone to follow a long route? How many kilometers? Absolutely. Um, that really varies by the, the model of the drone. Um, how many kilometers? Uh, it really is a function of two aspects of a drone. One is the um, communications link. How far can you communicate with that um, remote control with a drone. Um, and then also how long the battery or, or the fuel of the drone is going to take you. Um, generally with 
the standard commercial drones that are battery only operated, um, you're gonna get anywhere from uh, one kilometer to 15 kilometers currently. Um, some drones we're working with, that, for example, are hybrid, they can travel as far as, far as 100 kilometers and can last five hours. So uh, the answer is uh, that that's probably a practical limit. Uh, and of course, you can always um, you know, have a process where as your drone progresses, you just re refuel it, recharge it. And uh, with a lot of the um, mission control software that automates the process, um, the drone will return, you give it the battery, um, and it will continue on that mission that it started and it knows, knows where to pick up from and where, how to continue. I hope, that, I hope that answers the question. I think that does a great job in uh, answering the question. Another question says, um, could you expand um, on the, the uh, sorry, sorry, I'm reading this wrong. Um, it, would say, it would be nice if you could expand to, um, uh, on the drone applications in the energy sector, fossil fuel and renewables and how drones can be used to benefit both. Um, that is actually something for which I should produce another slide deck because it's, it's a huge area with huge benefits. Um, but particularly drones are used in the energy sector uh, for asset inspections. So think wind and solar farms being inspected by a drone. Uh, electric power towers um, before you send someone up on a dangerous mission of assessing a situation. Um, drones are used as an extension um, in the field of, of the worker, of the person um, before they put in those hazard hours climbing the tower, uh, essentially to do a, a preliminary assessment um, in case of um, you know, damage or, or weather, uh, weather incidents where you are dealing with um, needing to um, correct any issues. So drones are a terrific tool for that. Um, another good example is methane detection. Um, we uh, have seen drones used uh, where um, a methane detector is used as a payload on a drone and travels along the route of um, a gas pipeline and detects uh, methane. Uh, and again, methane is one of the major contributors to um, greenhouse emissions and uh, to, um, to pollution and this is uh, methane detection is, is, is really important in that regard. So there are many, many examples, but mostly um, uh, acid inspections and then um, uh, essentially uh, um, diagnosing issues and as an extension really of, of what um, the, the workers are doing in the field. Great. Uh, people are being really quiet right now, so we don't have any more questions to tap into. Um, so while we're waiting for someone to ask a question right now, and you can do that by typing into the Q&A um, on the uh, control panel, uh, if you can, uh, maybe if there are any takeaways that, that people should definitely go ahead or come away with, uh, anything like that, that uh, you want to highlight from the presentation that, uh, that people should remember. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think um, at some point I saw also a comment about uh, ASDM meetings uh, and um, having to do with uh, defining standards for um, drone operations and, and drone design. Uh, so I want to quickly touch on that. And um, that is an example of um, the work that I described that is going on behind the scenes in making sure that um, concepts like um, unmanned traffic management. Um, this is a concept that has to do with how do we manage the traffic in that um, uh, low altitude area and make sure that when, when we have uh, a high volume of drones traveling, they don't collide with each other, they don't fall out in the sky. Um, so I think someone brought up a, a good point that that committee is doing great work and, and helping in a number of areas that help establish those standards. Um, I, I think agreeing on standards and uh, frameworks for how to move forward with um, traffic management for drones um, is, is really a key part of what's coming and what we need to, the hurdle we need to 
uh, across in order to really unfold the, the full potential of, of drones. Um, I guess from there, um, we have no questions asked, so we'll let everyone know that if they do have questions they think of, you can reach out to us, uh, and we can definitely have those answered. Uh, this uh, Helen's uh, information there, and you can also send it to uh, to us at Cutter, um, and we can have those answered uh, if if uh, if Helen's busy. But Helen, thank you very much for a very informative presentation, and we uh, hope that. Uh, People have a lot of questions afterwards and they think about it and then they'll send them in and we'll get those answered. Absolutely, it was my pleasure. And uh, please don't hesitate to send any questions. We'll be very happy to answer them. And uh, thank you for participating. Thank you, Rich. Okay, thank you everyone. I hope everyone has a great day. And don't forget to uh, go to cutter.com to look for more of our upcoming sessions. Everyone have a great day.